Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Xa Talk Show. Today is August seventh, two thousand nineteen. Eight o'clock p.m. San Francisco time, and today we are going to talk about homotopy type theory, the foundation of mathematics, logic, proof theory, and the foundation of math. Now let me check if I'm alive. Good, I'm alive. And、uh, okay, let's modify this so people know. Random chat on math foundation proof theory T H E O R Y and、uh, hey good morning Daniel Langlois haven't seen you for the past few days. So today we are going to random chat on math foundation proof systems, proof theory, and、uh, homotopy type theory. Okay, <laughs> that's that's fantastic, esoteric. Hey, good morning. Uh, not J N S Z. Okay, <laughs> not 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 J. So we're gonna do random chat on this、uh, serious topic: math foundation proof systems, formalism. Logicism, intuition,、uh, intu intuitionism, construct constructivism, all these isms. Now these are about、uh, math foundation, basically, or you know, or philosophy of mathematics. Basically, they are、um, foundation of math. Okay, how do you explain that? Basically, it's like you know, one plus one equals to two, right? But how do you know? You know, so we have you know addition, multiplication, and so on. You know, three divided by you know four divided by two is two, and so on. But how do you know for sure? I mean, is it possible? Maybe you know, mathematicians do proofs, right? You know, they prove something. They prove prove prove、uh, four color theorems and so on. But how can you be sure? You know, maybe someday mathematician proved something that shows one plus one equals to three. You know, you have a you have a conflict. So is it just one plus one equals to two or three? You know, I mean, so I mean, so you know, you might think, oh, that's silly. You know, that will never happen. That you know, you cannot be sure because in the history of math,、uh, you know, every you know, there there are several、uh, crises. You know, because just like we are talking, you know, like. You know, all the mathematicians believe in one thing. Then some mathematician or something, you know, some mathematician discovers some other thing that totally,、uh, you know, surprised, shocked all the mathematicians. And usually, typically, often for like hundreds years or or you know, two hundred years, that these mathematicians they argue, you know, this is ridiculous. You are idiot. You know, this is. <laughs> This you are pseudo science, you know. They argue for hundred years, two hundred years until they find finally understand. Oh, so you know, so actually that is true, or you know, something like why is that true? So this happened, you know,、uh, in the history of math,、uh, basically throughout the history of math. So that is why we have this、uh, question about the、uh, foundation of math, or you know, philosophers. They they say a philosophy of math, or to mathematicians is the foundation. Basically, so can we actually, you know, so you have this crisis in the history of math.、Uh, you know, for example, two thousand years ago, the discovery of irrational numbers like square root of two or square root of three. You know, and you know that's those are irrational numbers, meaning that. Those numbers cannot be expressed as a fraction. You know, you you have you know two over three. That's a fraction, one point five. You know,、uh, so they discover mathematicians discovered irrational numbers. So you have this number that cannot be represented by a fraction. But you see, today we we don't think much of it because we understand. Oh yeah, obviously, you know, <laughs> obviously some number cannot be written as fractions, but not so. 
in, you know, back in the days, you know, back in the days, so all the mathematicians think, you know, fractions, but then, you know, so it's shocking. So this is like 2000 years ago, like discovered, you know, Pythagorean uh, school, you know, they, they, they have a philosophy, they have school and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you have this problem. By the way, guys, comments, okay, post opinions, uh, just post it. I'm just, I'm just going to do random chat on uh, on on uh, uh, you know foundation of math related stuff like logicism, formalism, proof the proof theory, and you know the, different schools of thought, different uh, logics, and also I want to mention you know I'm 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 not a expert in these subjects, but <laughs> you know every time I do a video I have you know like. I feel like uh, reserved or uh, there's a conflict like like I don't know the stuff you know so do you people so why should we tr you know uh, why should people watch my stuff you know but then I look at you know the YouTube all the millions followers they talk about drama those scammers you know <laughs> idiots <laughs> so so this is just uh, you know this this so I'm just going to chat about uh, this subject you know math foundation uh, stuff I, I've been reading about it but anyway uh, so I'm, I'm learning uh, so anyway so in the history of math there are several uh, uh, a great crisis you know a serious crisis because all the mathematicians believes in one thing but it turns out you know someone invented some other thing that's shocking and then they try to resolve it you know it usually takes a long time sometimes you know thousands of years um, sometimes a few hundred years, sometimes, you know, tens of years to to finally resolve or understand things. So anyway, back in 2000 years ago, there's a discovery of irrational numbers. OK, then, for example, then there is, um, uh, I guess, negative numbers also count. Uh, you know, I, I'm not too sure there is a great shock of that. But anyway, but then, for for example, then you have complex numbers. You know, you have a number whose square, uh, uh, um, you have a number. Uh, what? How do you say that? <laughs> complex. You know, complex numbers, the imaginary uh, numbers. Let's see. Uh, let's see again. How how do I? Um, Okay, so so basically, square root of negative one. Okay, so square root of negative one. Uh, let me explain a little. Bit. Yeah, in case you don't know, you know, I guess a lot of people know. But for example, a square root of four. So what does it mean? It means a number multiplied by itself twice. You know, n times n equals to four. So the answer is two here. So because two times two equals to 4. So therefore, uh, the square root of 4 equals to 2. And for example, square root of 9 e uh, equals to 3, because 3 times 3 equals to 9. Uh, <coughs> however, math mathematicians discovered that, uh, you know, when, when you when you try to manipulate solve equations, you know, you, you, you uh, it this this thing comes up, you know. This thing square root of equal, square root of negative one comes up, you know. And that's strange because no number, any number times itself, will be positive. It's impossible to have a number that times itself equals to negative one. So this is the birth, <coughs> the birth of complex numbers. So you know the mathematicians try to solve the problem, and they you know they run into this. It's a great puzzle until until we realized okay, there's you know we we realized basically we extended the number system. So you know for example, you have positive integers one two three four and so on. Everyone understand that's you know that's natural from millions of years ago. Then you have started mathematicians started to invent you know zero zero can be into play. So zero just means nothing. Okay, okay. Then negative numbers come into play because when you solve equations like you know something uh, uh, plus three uh, you know plus 
1 equals to 5. You know, x plus 1 equals to 5. So x, what is x? Uh, uh, OK, um, how do you say this? x, uh, x plus, uh, let's say x minus 1. Does that work? Uh, x m minus 1 equals to 5. No, that doesn't work. So x minus, OK, x minus 6 <laughs> equals to 5. You know, like when you, you go you go your daily life solving, you know, simple equations, then then you then you encounter this equ uh, equation x minus 6 equals to 5. You know, obviously we know that. So x equals to um, what? Wait, I, I get this wrong. Now this is uh, x minus 6 equals to 5. So plus yeah, so x equals to, um, no, this is wrong. <laughs> Shit, I cannot get the equation right. OK, let me read the comments. So Daniel Langlois says, since homotopy is a very loose notion of equality between maps, two, mathematic ma two mathematical objects are said to be homotopic if one can be continuously deformed into a, the other uh, right. Uh, mapping map and transformation tend to be used interchangeably. And Daniel says the mathematical notion of mapping is an abstraction of the process of making a geographic uh, map. Yeah, um, yeah, you, you're getting ahead of me. But anyway, so so what do uh, okay, I'm, I'm trying to some I'm, I'm trying to give us uh, explain the 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 historical crisis in math. So one of them is complex is well, uh, negative numbers, but I'm trying to give a equ equation about negative numbers. Okay, the easiest way to um, because I'm also talking so I don't do good. Uh, so let's say negative 3 plus 2 um, plus 4 equals to 1. Okay, so in this case, yeah, so we can say x plus 4 equals to 1. That, OK, that, that is an example. So when you do e uh, solve equations, you run into this x plus 4 equals to 1. So the obvious solution is x, x equals to negative 3. So that notion, the negative number, comes into play, you know, come, became, came to us. And you can, and this is still pretty intuitive, because if you do, uh, you know, if, if I borrow money from you, I owe you five dollars. You know that's kind of the sense of negative numbers. You know, so you have negative. You know, so negative numbers. Then, then you start at um, complex numbers. You you begin to have this square root of negative one. Then we understand it's uh, complex numbers. But the important thing to note is that at the time, you know, each of these crises. Okay, let me let me write it out. Math crisis in history. Uh, okay, let, let's just uh, write it like like I'm, we are going to write a blog in real time. So, um, math crisis in history, for example. Uh, okay, this. Um, okay, example. Discovery of irrational num irrational numbers. That is numbers that cannot be represented by a fraction such as square root of 2 uh, and that is like 2000 years ago then neg negative numbers when you solve equation like such as x plus 4 equals to 1, you get the notion of, uh, notion of negative numbers. OK, that's an uh, example showing browser. So example, discovery of irrational numbers, then negative numbers. Then we have example, complex numbers discovery of, of complex numbers, okay? 
the birth of complex numbers. Uh, okay, and uh, the the square root negative one came up because mathematicians are trying to solve polynomial of degree three. Okay. Uh, and and uh, degree four and degree three, degree four, degree five. You know they are trying to solve polynomial of degree three. For example, such as x uh, x cube cube x. You know the third power of x plus uh, plus one equals to zero, something like that. Uh, so so that is how the complex numbers came up. So remember, you know at the time, people don't understand it. You know. And and often mathematicians like attack you know they form schools they attack each other you know they 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 think you are a <laughs> you are a troll <laughs> you know <laughs> negative one square root of negative one you are a troll then eventually the, the people understand so all these are crises and uh, uh, for example another crisis um, example uh, example crisis in um, Euclidean geometry. Okay, uh, the crisis in Euclidean geometry is that, um, uh, you know, in, in Euclidean in, in geometry, like, you know, the triangles, uh, circles, you basically what happens that is that there is this book called the Euclid uh, uh, Elements. Hey, good morning, Matthew Sosa. Oh, I think I got the stream early today. Cool. Uh, so I'm, we are going through the crisis of math. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the Euclidean geometry is that, you know, there is this uh, book, Elements, uh, el, uh, 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 written by Euclid, which is a perfection of logic, you know, back, you know, for like over a thousand years. And uh, in this book, basically the, the, the OK, let, let, let's let's um, you know, instead of me just like uh, talking randomly, let's look up Wikipedia because it gives you a, a very um, a, a precise um, Euclid's elements. Okay, now this is a book. Uh, this is the uh, kind of a perfection of math for for over uh, a thousand years. Uh, this is this is written in uh, 300 BC, and uh, up to like 1500s, everyone studied this book, uh, Euclid's Elements. So what's the deal about this book? Well, they they teach theories of geometry. You know, triangles. How many angles are there? You know, how you know the angle sums to 180 degrees and things like that. And but however, it uses a strict logic you know uh, lo you know strictly based on logic you know it began with some five axioms you know like there exist you know things like that uh, axioms for example first of all it defines a point uh, which you know is just a point okay then it defines like uh, uh, one line can be connected to, you know to two points and things like that uh, let's see what what uh, So so anyway, it start with you know some axioms, which is not proven. You know, it just gives you you know these are the things we are going to work with. You know, you, you got point. I think you got lines, and you got uh, a few uh, axioms. Then you build up entire ge geometry. You know, for example, uh, what you know when you have uh, triangles such, such and such and such then this angle must be certain value. This angle is the value of, you know, the sum of the other two angles, things like that. So so this is the, uh, OK, so this is actually the um, Euclid's elements. So I, ha I haven't seen this. What year is this? A printed version of Euclid elements. Oh, so this is, that was um, 
1482. Okay, so that was 1482 printed. So the the thing about this book is it's like it's the perfection of logic. You know, it 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 tries to cover the whole geometry by logical deductive steps. You know, so it and so given the axioms, then it proves every theorem. Then new theorem are based on the theorem before. You know, so everything is like very solid. So that's Euclid's elements. That's Euclidean geometry. But so what what is the crisis? The crisis is that. Okay, the crisis is that in this in this um, in this book, there are five axioms. Okay, five postulates. Okay. Now four of them are pretty obvious, but there's a, a fifth one that's not too obvious. Okay, <laughs> like if you are a mathematician, you read it. You know the fifth fifth one is not too obvious, so it would be better. Now, you know, you might think, okay, so the axiom num number five is not necessary because maybe we can prove axiom, you know, postulate number five by using the, you know, axiom one, two, three, four. So we eliminate, you know, one one axiom because that would be better. You know, we want a small number of axioms to begin with, you know. So there's this uh, postulate postulate number five. Let, let me show the uh, Wikipedia so you can read it. Um, okay, influence, contents, Euclid met methods, criticism, uh, editions. Okay, they don't talk about that. Um, we, 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 we can actually just search it. Euclid postulate five. Okay, we can just find it. Uh, Euclid's postulates. Okay, fifth post postulate. There are there are many websites about this because this is a huge topic in math because it's a crisis. Uh, parallel postulate. That's it. Let's let's go uh, show uh, Wikipedia. So in ge geometry, the parallel postulate, also called Euclid's fifth postulate, because it is the fifth postulate in Euclid's elements is a okay is a distinctive axiom in Euclidean geometry it states that uh, in two dimensional geometry okay this is what it says if a line segment intersects two straight lines forming two interior angles on the same side uh, the, the, uh, blah, blah, blah. anyway basically it, it, what what it is trying to say is that if you have two lines um, Basically, what it's trying to say is, if you have, um, if you have two lines, then then three possibilities will happen. Two possibilities will happen. One is that they will intersect. You know, when when, when you have two lines, you know, there are two possibilities. One, they will intersect. Two. They will never, never intersect when they are parallel. That's that's the essence of the parallel postulate. You know the fifth postulate. Okay, then you know so so this is given. Like it, it it's it doesn't have any proof. It just says it is so. <laughs> you know, then you prove all all your theorems, like in, entire two D geometry theorems and three D geometry from from this given. So this this postulate is questionable, you know. Uh, you know, okay, so two lines there are two possibilities. They cross each other or they don't. Uh but so mathematicians tr tried to prove this from the previous four axioms. You know, with hundreds of years greatest mathematicians, they they realize, you know, nobody can do it, you know, it's just it's just they cannot do it. So eventually, we understand. We realize that this postulate is 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 um is independent of of Euclidean geometry. That is, you cannot you cannot prove this is the case. No, you nor can you disprove it is the case. Rather, it's like you begin with a set of axioms. It's independent. You in other in other words, mathematicians discovered that. 
you can have a geometry like entire geometry system such that given two lines you know one of the axiom is that given two lines they will always intersect always okay in other words there's no parallel lines and and you can other have other another geometry such that given two lines they will never intersect so you see this is like very strange you know in a normal world, we, we think of, you know, of course, two lines, they will either intersect once or they will never intersect when they are parallel. This is, you know, the world we live in, you know, no more, no more intuition. But you see, the Euclidean uh, elements, Euclid's elements, it's based on logic. You know, it's not about what you think, you know, what you feel. It's about you have to prove ev everything by logic. You have to, you know, go step by step. Then, you know, so, you know, this, this is part of the, you know, this is kind of the, you can almost say the Greek geometry is the origin of study of logic, okay, which in turn, what we have is foundation of math, proof, proof theory, and uh, latest homotopy type theory, okay, type theories and, you know, and category theory. So anyway, so you kind of elements, you know, it's based on logic and you got this uh, parallel postulate, which is very strange. And mathematicians try to prove it or, you know, eventually we realize that this is actually independent. I mean, you, you so we realize you could have a entire system of geometry, you know, where the fifth postulate is, you know, alternative. So when 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 given two lines, they when they if they always cross each other, that geometry is called um, sphere, uh, um, uh, elliptical geometry. And on the other hand, if two lines never cross each other, that is uh, that is called hyperbolic geometry. Uh, I I don't know you know I I don't know them you know like like I said I'm I'm no expert in these things but you know I studied them so I'm just, you know this is just, just a, a talk about them uh, and and maybe you'll you know find it interesting and study math uh, you know it, it's it so anyway so you so that is when you see when we say Euclidean geometry today you know like you you might have heard it what what like what uh, you might think E U C L I D E A N geometry Okay, let's search it. You might think, okay, why is there, you know, geometry is just, just ge geometry. Why do you call it Euclidean geometry? It is because we realized that there are different geometries. You know, you could have a geometry that's not, you know, two lines never cross each other. So that, that is why in this Euclid's elements, this system, this system that that is most intuitive to most of us, you know, this geometry system we call Euclidean geometry, you know, but then you have um, others. Uh, let's see, um, you know, so if you read this, you'll see the history, you know, the Wiki Wikipedia gives you details, um, you know, uh, much more precise. But then we can see, we found that you, then we have non-Euclidean geometry. You know, so we have hyperbolic geometry, then you have elliptic geometry. So th those are geometries that's entirely different system. So anyway, so so this is a major crisis. The discovery of non-Euclidean geometry is a major crisis in mathematics. Non-Euclidean geometry, a major crisis in math. And this happened around... 1700s, I think. Uh, uh, 1700. Uh, around 1700. And by the way, the complex number, the discovery of complex numbers, that also happened around the same time. So you see, the mathematicians, <laughs> they, 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 they got into this crisis because nobody, you know, nobody in their same mind would think, Oh, two lines they will always intersect you know nobody will think you know things like that but but if you go by logic you know if you follow strictly logic you know you realize that that is actually valid you know you can you cannot say it's invalid maybe you don't see it in this world in this real world but 
it is actually logically consistent you know it, it's a it's an entire world you know non-euclidean geometry you discovered like nobody knew this before you know before 1700 uh, year let's see what year uh, I forgot what year but they say it somewhere here um, 1400 to 1700 I, I guess no wait uh, Yes, sp spherical geometry give a, gives us the simplest model of elliptic geometry. Um, I, I cannot vouch that for sure because I don't, you know, I don't really know these subjects <laughs> so well. So, uh, you know, because when you actually talk about these things, you got to be, I mean, the, the, you know, uh, if you ask, you know, mathematics, you got to be very specific, you know, very specific. You know, you cannot just say, uh, you know, every term, like in math, you, you almost always every term, they have very, especially today, they have very precise definitions based on, you know, um, set theory and logic, very precise, like you can, just like you, you class elements, you know, they, we, this is, this is all uh, foundations of math is about. Everything is, you know, precisely defined as opposed to like programmers, you know, Haskell. Oh, type type theory, type type language is best, you know. Oh, object oriented is the best because this is that, you know. So so math is a different world. So anyway, you you non Euclidean geometry, it's like a entire new world. Okay. You know, this is uh, so so very deep because it means, you see, it means our universe. You know, for example, today we we talk about black holes or warm holes or or you know things like that, or or you know ten dimensions things like that. But it all came, <laughs> you you could say it all came from math because with the Euclidean geometry, you begin to see. That maybe our universe is like just one of them. There are there are other universes that's that's very different. And in fact, uh, also I don't think we know. Yeah, I, you know, I think you know mathematicians, you know, the astrocosmologists, we do not know actually exactly, uh, you know, what is the shape of our, of our space. Like is it hyperbolic or Euclidean or elliptic? I think we don't know that actually. Um, I I think okay. I I don't know for sure um, because this is based on from uh, what I read. There's this great book. Uh, uh, shape of space. I this is a great book. I recommend to check it out. Uh, uh, because this book talks about the shape of space, you know, like not just Euclidean. But anyway, it's a great book, and it's written uh, such that it's written for non-mathematicians. So it's an introduction, so anyone can uh, read it. So go buy it. Okay, go buy from my website. I make a few bucks. So anyway. So this non-Euclidean geometry is a major crisis in math. Okay. So this is so um, so 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 this is why you know when we talk about the philosophy of math or foundation of math, you know, like we were talking about before, you know, we were I I was saying you know one plus one equals to two, but maybe you know how do you know for sure? You know maybe one plus one equals to three. Maybe some mathematician will prove that. You know, <laughs> then we have a situation. You know, like so, but you know you might think oh that's silly. You know, but actually that's not silly because all these things you know you you see you know, mathematicians the history of math it happened. You know, it happens. Then, then you have other. I mean, that's not all. Then you have um, set theory. Okay, set theory is also was a shocking uh, thing to mathematicians. Then you have Godel, Godel's uh, theorem. Okay, In incomplete, <laughs> incompleteness theorem. Now, this, so this is uh, like shocking, you know, like it change, it basically, they are like revolutions in math. They change the entire thought uh, about the entire math. You know, all these things happened. So that is why 
uh, you want to study. I mean, that that is why the foundation of math proofs, you know, such as logic, proof systems, proof theory, uh, and homotopy type theory, they become important. Now, homotopy type theory, they have a different kind of different background. Let's gonna we, let's talk about that uh, in a bit. But anyway, so this is why the foundation of math is an issue. It's a major critical. Uh, research area, you know, because we want to know just, just, you know, just when is a theory, you know, is it possible for some theory to become invalid, you know, you know, someday. So that's a foundation of math. That is, that is why it is important. Um, Okay, so this let me take. So how many? How much? Uh, okay, I've been talking for thirty-five minutes. So let's read um, the uh, comments. So the Neil says one point is that spherical geometry gives us a, give us a, gives us perhaps the simplest model of ellipt uh, elliptic geometry, and it always existed. Yeah. So no major crisis. Yes. No, wait. No, well, then, then Daniel says not nobody in their same mind says that. Well, no, that no, that's a different. That's that's. Um, let me let me try to explain that. Uh, yeah. So you are saying you know spherical geometry, basically you know uh, geometry on a sphere. For example, if you draw a triangle on a sphere, they are not you know their angle do not sum to one hundred eighty degrees. That's different from. Euclidean geometry, where the sum of triangle always sum to 180 degrees, but however, uh, however, spherical geometry is still Euclidean geometry. You see, because you know it's just three, you know it's still uh, well. You see, because back then you don't have the idea of 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 uh, non Euclidean geometry. So how you know? So how do I um? You don't have the crisis situation, you know, be, because like so. What I'm saying is that in retrospect, okay, in retrospect, you can look at spherical geometry and you say, oh, that's a model of uh, elliptical geometry, you know, that's a well, the model of the uh, non Euclidean elliptical geometry. You can say that in retrospect, but remember, that's a model. That's that's what we are talking about. We are using models, you know. For example, uh, hyperbolic geometry can be modeled on. Uh, let, let me show you some examples. Hy hyperbolic geometry. Um, okay, so yeah, so let's go here and let's uh, go to the uh, hyperbolic geometry. So that's going to be here. S pseudo sphere. Now, now, now this surface is called pseudosphere. So it's like sphere, but not, you know, it's like pseudosphere. Very interesting. This, you know, you can look up on Wikipedia, so you'll get a lot of information. Now, pseudosphere is a model of the hyperbolic geometry. So hi remember, hyperbolic ge geometry means any two lines, they will uh, never intersect each other. OK, remember, we have uh, non Euclidean geometry, we have these three types never intersect each other. So so on this surface, pseudosphere, it gives it it gives a model. You know, remember this is critical. Um, it's just a model. It's not this is not hyperbolic geometry. Okay. This this pseudosphere, this this surface called we call it pseudosphere, which is a surface in three-dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, it's not hyperbolic space. It's in you know Euclidean space that we can model. You know, it gives us as a like a ex, you know like example a visual you know a tangible model to represent hyperbolic geometry, two-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. You see, that's what it is. In other in in in, in um, in another se in, in another way, the sphere, which is a uh, which is a three-dimensional object in Euclidean space, you know, it gives us a model. You know, the surface of a sphere it gives us a, a, a model of a uh, 
the non-Euclidean elliptical geometry, I think. Okay, I, I'm not too sure about whether this qualify. You know, yeah, I, you know, like <laughs> that's it's just random chat. Okay, I don't. I'm not expert on this subject. Uh. Okay, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel always have a lot of things to say. So Daniel says. Uh, all raindrops begin as roughly spherical. Uh, yeah. The, uh, why? So Daniel says, why are longitude lines not parallel to each other? Oops. Uh, what? Geographic coordinate system. <laughs> okay. Well, I, anyway, yeah. So you know, Daniel is talking about you know latitudes and longitude and stuff. But but let me continue on with the um, you know the the foundations of math stuff. So um, so yeah. So you see, there are a lot of crises. That's why mathematicians begin to you know really want to understand you know the logic systems and foundations. That's very interesting. Okay, one. Uh, there are two more crises. I, 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 I could kind of like explain, uh, like the crisis. You know, the beginning of set theory, which is this is very interesting. Okay, this is also one of the shocking thing. And and Cantor, the guy who invented set theory, is Cantor because this is shocking. This okay. So set theory. This is the beginning of comparing the size of infinities <laughs> okay <laughs> now this is one way to put it that's you know to make it interesting well i mean it, it is interesting by itself you know you see when we have in, in infinite you know like what we have like infinite number of oranges over here then we have infinite number of apples over there and uh, intuitively, we think, oh, they are just infinite. You know, both are infinite, so they are like the same number of infinite, maybe. <laughs> but, but not not really, because it, it, he discovered, you know, you can compare. They are different sizes of infinity. For example, let me see. Let's let, let's give an example. Let's let's say the example. Okay, so let let me let me type it. Which one is larger? A, the the set of all positive integers. Uh, for example, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, and so on. Okay, A, the which one is larger? A, the set of all positive integers. B the set of uh let's type it here the set of all even positive integers so we, so that means two four six okay uh let's show in browser so which one is larger a the set of all positive inter integers integers one two three four five and so on be the set of all even positive integers two, four, six, and so on. So, two. Uh, normally, we would think, you know, obviously, this is so obvious. The 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 set of all positive integers is larger, because you know, because the even positive integers you are skipping, you know, you are skipping one. So, in a sense, the set of all positive integers is larger than you know. It has more stuff. In in fact, precisely like half. Half times, you know, two times more number of elements than the set of positive integers. Integers, I mean, than the set of even positive integers, <laughs> and that is wrong. That is a wrong answer. In fact, we understand today, you know, they they actually they are equal number of elements. Like like they are their size are the same. You see, but this is tremendously. Shocking, you know, because this is not. How can you possibly? How can that possibly be true? Because everyone, you know, every child can see that you got more numbers in the set of all positive integers than 
compa as compared to the even positive integers, which you actually take out one element at, at every step. So, but so Cantor he created he 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 created the set theory, which is which begin with like kind of like uh, answer to this question. He gives. So he he uh, you know when I learned this like I learned this in 1991 okay it was you know it was really shocking you know it was like you feel the power of the universe you know the mystery <laughs> you you I felt you know like it's like if you are really into uh, you know math and truth you you felt something you know shocking going on so the way he did it is you know he you know, explain that logically, you know, by, by pure logic, logic he, he, you know, he asks you, okay, so, so, okay, you have infinite things, you have a lot of infinite things, you want to compare them to see uh, which one has more uh, elements. So one way to do it, you know, he give out his reasons, basically it's like this, okay, so you have one set, you have another set, and you want to see which one has more uh, number of elements so he says one way to do it okay uh, is that if you can match every element with the element in the other uh, set you know it's like you have a bunch of cups here okay you have a set of cups you know cups like coffee cups you know then on the other hand you have a set of spoons you know like spoons you know so one way to see which set has more elements is by if you can match uh, one element with the other pair by pair. Like you you put one spoon in a cup. You know you you put one spoon in a, in a in a cup. So this is a pair. You know so it's matched. You if you can do that for every element um, in in the set, then you know these two sets have exactly the same number of elements okay then you know for sure even though both of them are in infinite but you know they have exactly the same element and and this argument you see every child can see this is you know valid very valid logic you know logical uh, argument so so meaning so if you can have a function that maps one set to the other for el all elements in the set, then you must follow the conclusion that these two sets are have the equal number of elements. So all you have to do now is to find a function that maps, you know, the po positive integers to the uh, to the even positive integers. So can can I actually do that? Um, Can I do that? <laughs> I'm not sure I can do that on this. I I don't remember, you know. I forgot. But actually, if you read, yeah, you know, if I'm gonna do it, you know, it's gonna take ten minutes trial and error, you know. So let's just read. Um, um, uh, I'm gonna show you. A, a, you know, you can read about it. Set theory, okay? So let's um, let's find. Let's try to find an article where, uh, where that discuss this this uh, particular issue, because on Wikipedia, if you just read uh, set theory, okay. So let's go to actually. Uh, let's actually search for countable countable set. Okay, there it is. So if you read this article, you you will uh, see you will find a function you can actually you know think of this as a homework you know find a function that maps for every element uh, positive integers map it to uh, uh, every element of the even positive positive integers so you can you know if you read the countable set in Wikipedia you you'll know how to do that so anyway so Cantor you know he so this was shocking so you know and uh, in turn, he discovered that real numbers are not countable. Uh, real numbers. So meaning that, you know, so 
basically he came up with uh, I, you know the idea that infinite sets they have kind of order they, they it's called the ordinal of uh, you know basically the size like uh, you know the, I give you a size for this internet infinite set you can now actually kind of compare you know we you know we it, sh it shows a light that it shows us that we there are you know different uh, order like different sizes of of infinite infinities so anyway that's that's uh, that's that's the set theory that's uh, that's what set theory is about so this so this was you know this was you know it's a it's a shocking you know back then you know <laughs> mathematicians they fight each other you know some some call Cantor a troll you know get him fired you know things like that it, it's a, a big chapter of history of math so you can see all these are crises in math then then there's this guy Hilbert, a German mathematician, uh, David Hilbert. Hey, good morning, Spano champ. So, guys, uh, any comments? Matthew Saucers, any one comments? Co comments. So, actually, I dragged on about. Oh my God! You know, I, I was talking about foundation of math, but. It ends up, I spent 50 minutes talking about, you know, the historical crisis of mathematics, which, you know, justifies the, uh, the valid, you know, why the foundation, study of the foundation of math is critical, is important. I mean, why, you know, it's not just, oh, it's just philosophy, you know, philosophy, <laughs> you know, thinking about useless things. It's not that, because you, all this crisis. Um, but we haven't got into, you know, what, what I wanted to <laughs> talk originally was formalism, logicism, and uh, intuit intuitionism. Uh, which is kind of also became constructivism. Uh, okay, so so again, anyway, yeah. So we are going, uh, we are getting onto that. Um, uh, so David Hilbert, you know, he's one of the great greatest mathematician. You know, maybe top ten or something in history. So he. He started a school of thought, you know, back, you know, he's, he was born in uh, 1862. So you can see this is the era where all this crisis happened. Now he's a contempor con contemporary of uh, Cantor, George Cantor. Uh, George Cantor, okay. Um, uh, well, let's, let's look up his name. Yeah, George Cantor, he's also, um, German mathematician, you know, Ger German are usually great at math. German, uh, Russian, and well, anyways, you know, there's a lot of great mathematicians. So anyway, he's also um, a German guy. So he's uh, he was born 1845. Okay. Uh, David Hilbert was born 1862. Yeah. So they are contemporaries. You know, they they know each other. Um, but uh, so David Hilbert, so with all this crisis, you know, David Hilbert started to have a program, you know, he, you know, that they, you know, basically they want to codify all math. So they, you know, mathematicians begins, wants to desire, you know, they desire a, like a system or you, you can think of it like a programming language, you know, they want a system so that so that mathematicians can prove that this system is consistent and uh, then then every mathematics will be based on this system so you know we want a solid foundation so you know we can start to grow math without all this crisis you know <laughs> every once in a while a major crisis you know comes in you know the crises are critical because they 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 seems to collapse your entire math because what you think is true is no longer true that that is the thing because you think oh this is white this is black 
then some some mathematicians discover something then your white and black is no longer you you know your entire life's you know experience is shattered you know you it's that is what you know white crises are critic you know become that crisis so they so david hilbert you know began he well basically he began the school of formalism uh then bertrand russell began the school of uh, logicism they are different schools of thought uh, a different kind of school of thought they all want to have a, a solid foundation of math bertrand russell is kind of my favorite author you know in the 1990s i read most of his books you know he's he's a logician and uh, you know i i um, i follow him a lot i read like almost all his stuff his biographies and stuff so bertrand russell you know he you know he's a he's a leader or who or proponent of the logic school uh so logicism school of thought is that okay so the logic school is that they think that math the entirety of math can be reduced to logic you know uh, like if this is so and that is so therefore you know uh, you know reduced to logic the formalist school formalism uh, their belief you know the david helbert his belief is that the math math is nothing but just symbol manipulation <laughs> you know like you know when you do high school algebra you have x plus you know x squared equals to five you know you think you can add you know a quantity to both side you can minus something both side or divide both side by anything not zero you know then then you can solve the equation you know that's manipulation of symbols so uh so david helbert he his idea of math he believes in formalism formal formality that's the same word the same root of word okay formal formality form you know you know we have the phrase form and function so david hilbert he believes in form formal formalism form formality meaning that he believed math is 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 simply manipulation of symbols nothing else it does not necessarily have a meaning so you are given a bunch of strings like formal language okay so much of computer science today formal language is a foundation of computers theoretical computer science you know forget about tuning machines lambda calculus <laughs> actually lambda calculus is is a branch of formal language theory uh not not tuning machines i you know not 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 exactly but anyway formal language which which is a subject i love uh which is you know um last week i did a video on what's the meaning of symbols in a programming language like lisp and mathematica uh check that out because that is a uh, symbolic math algebra and and that you have pattern matching you have symbolic pattern matching and and w which ties to regular expressions and grammar and context free grammar you know parsing compilers and stuff so the theory aspect of them are all formal languages formal language so this is critical okay so uh read it up formal language okay this is uh one of the foundation of theoretical computer science formal language this this is the school i like okay <laughs> this is my school of thought e everything else is garbage uh so anyway formal languages so yeah so all these are related formalism formalism you know formal formality form formal languages the essence of their meaning is that it's just like pure symbols you just have se sequence of symbols like string you know everything is just a string then you have a bunch of rules to manipulate it so it's just like it's just a form you know so that's that's david helber's idea you know his philosophy he believes math all math is can be reduced to formalism it's just uh, you just you know begin with a string 
then you have some rules how to transform the string um, and th that is a system then you can give interpretation you know then oh this means you know uh, you know particular theory you know some some theory in math oh this is some theory in differential equations in fundamental theorem of calculus or all that that's that's just interpretation you know but he believes everything can you know the whole math is just uh, symbols and manipulation and on the other hand Bertrand Russell believes if you know math is just logic you know you can reduce it the whole thing to logic then there's another school I don't like very much <laughs> back then okay Intuit, uh, intu intuitionism. Okay, that's uh, started by this uh, J.W. Bohr guy. Very strange. Uh, you know, intu uh, intuitionism, uh, intuitionism. Okay. Uh, and today, a branch of it is called constructivism. Uh, okay, so uh, this is started by intuit intuitionism is started by uh, let's find the guy's name. Uh, where is it? Infinity history. Okay, so uh, the several guys. You know, usually they are not started by one single guy. Usually it's like uh, several influences. Influences. Okay, this guy. L E J Brewer Brewer some you know uh so he was born in 1881 and Dutch okay he's uh Dutch anyway so he's kind of like the founder of intuitionism which is very strange and you know <laughs> I didn't like it. I don't I didn't like it back then but there's a twist I like it now because this is why so math is so interesting okay okay so am I making sense guys type something so except Daniel is Daniel kept typing uh, well yeah about you know that uh, <laughs> anyways that's, that's about something anyway I, I want to finish the you know I want to finish the talk about you know some interesting things about foundation of math okay you know philosophy of math so anyway Bru Bru uh, Brewer he created intuitionism uh, you can read about what it is exactly but basically it's like they refuse it's very strange okay if you know if you encounter it for the first time they re they refuse the thought that any everything is either or not okay for example <laughs> for you <laughs> for example one plus one equals to two okay is that true I mean that's a, a proposition let's say one plus one equals true e equals to two okay you can say whether it's true or whether it's false you know it's either true or false it's very simple true or false but intuitionism doesn't believe that they believe <laughs> it's not just true or false there's something else okay you know this is a dramatic way to put it it's called excluded middle okay uh, let's look up Wikipedia I'm pretty sure there's a article yes law of excluded middle so in logic the law of excluded middle states that for any proposition either that proposition is true or its negation is true okay uh, yeah so the law of exclude excluded middle so if I say something either it's true or it's false you know there's no like I mean what else could it be you know it, it, it's so simple this is called law of excluded middle now the problem is you see if you are a uh, intu uh, intuitionist you don't believe this uh, law of excluded middle <laughs> okay you see so there's a section logicists logicists versus intuitionists 
So let's read it. Okay, so in late 1800s through the 1930s, a bitter, persistent debate raged between Hilbert and his followers versus Hemingway and uh, L.E.J. Brewer. Brewer's philosophy, called intuitionism, started in earnest with uh, Leopold Kronecker in late 1800s. Okay, anyway, that, that's some details about their fight. You know, it's a war. It's, it's a big war between mathematicians. But anyway, it's the largest, you know, largest, you know, largest uh, school of thought versus the intu intuitionist. And one of the big points is the, uh, the law of excluded middle. Because in intuitionists, they don't believe that. They don't believe, you know, if you prove it's not true, then it's false. If you prove it's false, then therefore it must be true. It, it, they don't believe such a thing. And to me, that's just like, when I, when I learned this, when I, when I read about this in 1990s, you know, in, from books, they don't have Wikipedia back then. I think it's stupid, you know, <laughs> but now I see much point in that. This, so this is why, you know, I'm doing this talk show because this many interesting things. Hey, good morning, just Justin Hayes. Hey, uh, hi, hi to Canada. Hi, hi to Vancouver. Uh, okay, I, I'm actually, I've been talking for like um, one hour and six minutes. I'm about to end. We should because I've been talking too long. So I've been talking about, so uh, let's do a su quick summary. So we've been talking about for the past one hour about the various crises in, in the history of math. Then uh, we talked about that because we want to justify why are we studying the foundation of math? I mean, why do mathematicians find this critical? So this is a critical because of all these crises. And then we begin to c talk about the three major school of thought of, of the foundation of math. So the three schools of thought are formalism of David Hilbert, uh, 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 yeah, formalism of David Hilbert, uh, and uh, uh, logicism led by Bertrand Russell, and uh, the intuitionism led by the um, by the Brewer guy, you know, by the Brewer L E uh, by this L E J Brewer guy. And we kind of gave some kind of, some kind of you know summary of what they are about. Formalism is about everything is just a symbol mani manipulation. Logicism is the belief that the whole math can be reduced to logic, you know, it's, um, uh, and uh, the in intuitionism, they believe, they believe kind of, they actually, they, you know, they believe the law of excluded middle is, is false, you know, it's not, cannot be used to prove math. Basically, they believe constructionativism. Uh, constructive I think that's the word okay constructivism now that word has much meanings in outside of math but but that's not what we are um, interested we you know because in philosophy you have all these many of them questionable things uh, but okay so let's try to find it constructivism math okay here so Intuitionism. I mean, by the way, I, I want also to add. You know, let me repeat again. I'm not. I'm not an expert in this subject. So, if you are interested, you know, go uh, read read Wikipedia. If you are a mathematician, you know, professor, math, professional mathematician or logician, feel feel free to you know come and correct. But only if you know, not programmers. You know, if you are just like me, you know, programmers, you have opinions. They, 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 they may not be correct, okay, because, so I want to also to mention these ideas, formalism, logicism, they are, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying them also, and, but also they are very precise and very detailed, you know, they are, they are not like something you can just 
pick up and in one hour they, they you have to to understand all this in full detail you have to basically uh, like uh, equivalent to a PhD degree okay so anyway so you know yeah go re go read Wikipedia which is actually uh, trustworthy on these subjects now constructive is I mean uh, now one one the main part of in intuitionism the school of thought is that they believe in constructive mathematics uh, simply put that means they if you want to prove for example something exists or something doesn't exist you know for example some number with certain properties exist or doesn't exist the constructivism you know the school of thought is believes that uh, you you actually have to build it I mean like show the number something you know kind of like that like programming okay Th this is why the intu in intuitionism and constructivism are so much relevant today because you know today especially you know among Haskell camp programmers they <laughs> they like to talk about you know category theory and you know many math jargons and and how they relate to prove you know the 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 something something iso means iso morphism you know <laughs> Justin probably knows that you know a, a lot more than me uh, because I think Justin is a Haskell coder right so so there is this uh, you know popular uh, heart um, phrase you know Howard Curry isomorphism you know bantered around by Haskell coders often uh, Howard Curry Howard uh, isomorphism okay so let's uh, let's look at that up yeah Curry Howard correspondence okay essentially it means that it's a theory such that any computer program you know algorithm step-by-step -step instruction is can be translated to a proof and any proof can math you know any math proof can be also translated to a um, to a computer program that, that's kind of the gist you know kind of uh, of this is about so it's very popular among you know uh, Haskell communities okay so Justin says I'm a scholar scholar in Haskell coder learning about category theory okay so yeah so yeah I'm uh, yeah I'm, I'm learning about these things too so um, so what, what are we saying so yeah the in, in, intuism you know they believe in constructive math that is they believe in you cannot prove something exists or doesn't exist by anyway they, they believe in, one one of the big thing is that they believe in in actual building something then you can say it exists okay they don't like to talk about but usually okay something like that the int intuitionism the these people they don't they don't believe in anything dealing with infinity okay <laughs> they, when you deal with something in infinity they don't you know they, they don't like it they, they, they don't believe it they believe you know if you want to talk about something like in in a realm of infinity okay you have to actually build it like like show me show me you know okay I found this number with such a property then you say it exists you cannot say you cannot arrive at something exists or does, doesn't exist by the argument of contradiction you know which is a um, conventional proof you know uh, method of proof in math they, they they can prove something by contradiction meaning that we begin with this assumption then we use logic step by step we show we arrive at a at a conclusion that is absurd you know conflict with itself then you say then you know the traditional mathematicians say okay then the assum assumption is wrong okay that you know something exists is wrong therefore something does not exist you know this is the 
um, proof by contradiction. Okay, yeah, let, let's look up. <coughs> proof by contradi uh, contradiction. Uh, yeah, we, we want uh, search, we don't want dictionary. Okay, yeah, so there's a Wikipedia article on that. Proof by contradiction. Now, this, this is accepted by majority of mathematicians. But however, if you are a intuitionist, you know, if you are the constructive constructivism school of people, you don't you don't believe in that. When 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 a mathematician shows a proof, you know, and using the method of, method of proof by contradiction, you you as far as you are concerned, you don't believe it. You know, <laughs> that's not proof. That's not you know that's unproven. So that's the school of uh, the intuitionism. People, so that's very interesting because today, so you see, so I find this very interesting because today, you know, we have been trying to because since the computer age, you know, since 1940s, we have computers. Then we have you know digital computers, CPU. You know, <clears throat> we started to uh, and we research into artificial intelligence, and we started to research into automated proof systems. You know imagine how fantastic it is you know like we can write programs right you know programs you know so you know programs are so logical because computer doesn't make errors you, you know so why don't we write a program so that it can just prove everything you, you know we can it, it, and let it run by itself you know it just prove everything you know prove it will automatically find the theory of relativity you know and you automatically find whatever you know theories we don't know yet that's that would be fantastic so this score is called automated proof theory um automate uh, <coughs> automated proof uh um did i spell it wrong p r o o f Okay, auto yeah, this this field is called automated theory improving. You know, this this is like a great fantastic goal. If we can actually find a way to do that, you know, we you know, we have computers just let it run. You you prove everything. So this is part of the research into the uh, foundation of math, you know, including all these different schools. And today we know that you know, I've been looking into this because I'm so interested. You know, as a programmer, you think, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, automated proof theorems. We we have, you know, Google, petrabyte of data. We just, you know, chunk, you know, just run run them in parallel. Then we'll, we'll find every everything. It's not like that. First of all, there, there are so many issues against that, this fantasy. Because first of all, you have, you have things like, uh, you have things like theories in cellular automata. You know how do you say that? Um, meaning that even you know, like the deterministic. I mean, even if the whole entire world is deterministic by a, by a rule, by a simple rule, however, you can still not predict the future. <laughs> you know, even though everything is deterministic, like you know, philosophers talk about free will. Like how do you I, how do you know you have free will? You know, and then some argue you actually don't have free will because if you know the universe, physics, atoms, they they work according to certain rules. You know, physics. Therefore, free will is impossible because you are actually just mechanisms. You know, you are just you think of this way or that way because the wheels. You know, the cock wheels in your brain. They, you know, they rotate this way, that way. Therefore, you are. Therefore, I'm talking about this right now. You know, like everything is determined. You know, there's you. Uh, but it turns out, you know, the if, even if the universe is de deterministic, you cannot predict predict what will happen in the future because because essentially. You have to run the computation. That, like if if you, um, uh, I'm not sure. There's, uh, I think there's a name to this. What I'm talking about right now, 
anyone knows but I'm not sure what is the name but anyway if you uh, study if you uh, read into a cellular automata you might find that um, uh, you know like a term that describes the situation where where even if the universe is deterministic it's not predictable uh, or you can maybe it's in the article of determinism in Wikipedia you, you might find it uh, you, you can also look up free will you know they have articles like that but anyway, so back to the uh, so so there are many obstacles to the you know the automated theory improving improving everything because first of all so yeah even if you found a system where you can just run programs keep it running it will find all theories in the universe even if that is true and even if you have you know you know you have a computer system that's 10 billion times than today then you can still not find you know new theorems because because possibly possibly because you have to compute for a billion years you see that's one of the ob obstacle even you ha if you have the automated computer system it might be tr you know it might take you 1 million 1 billion years to find to find the theorem because you know I mean, regardless how powerful is your computer, you can assume it's, you know, billion or 10 billion or gazillion billion times more powerful. It's, I mean, you see, all these are relative. You still have like a, a billion years to compute it. So that's one obstacle. Then there are other obstacles. Like when we study into the foundation of math, you know, these logics, you know, you realize, like as a programmer, okay, I started to, uh, you know, I study them, I read them, I realize it's not so simple. You started to see, okay, so logics. So there's this this model, this system, you know, logic system, just like the Euclidean geometry, you know, you, you, you Euclidean geometry, non-Euclidean, you know, hyperbolic or elliptic. They are different systems. So you study logic you realize that okay there's this logic system then there's you know first order logic then there's a second order logic you know they have pros and cons then you have other things like model logic then then uh, type theory you know the, you you kind of like this bunch of things and it's not like one is better than the other it's like pros and cons you know it's like programming languages <laughs> you know you think oh there's one programming language that solves open <laughs> turns out you know it's just this bunch of logic systems and yeah so it gets very deep and very complex <laughs> so you end up so you know like i'm thinking oh if i just study logic then then i'll know you know the solid foundation of math so it's not like that. So there are different schools of math. Each school have sub schools. You know they differ. You just like philosophy. Then logic. You know logic. There are different types. They each has pros and cons. So it's not like one solves all. Then you have Gödel incompleteness theorem. Okay, that's <laughs> that's another thing we haven't talked about. Um, yeah. So you know. So it's a uh, very interesting. Okay, I think that's kind of that's that covered what I wanted to uh, cover. Basically, uh, you know, I, I so we covered crisis of math in history, the importance of foundation of math, the different schools of um, philosophy of mathematics, and uh, today's situation where we have, you know, we we try to have proof systems, you know, automated proof uh, theory. Um, and programming languages like Haskell is kind of well Haskell you know it should be said you know Haskell is not actually it doesn't have anything to do with proofs really it, it rather is just a a pure functional programming which which um, are heavily associated with these uh, things we are talking about you know so there are several languages like this one called Cock uh that is a programming language to do proof uh and many haskals you know are familiar with you know or heard of you know it's kind of 
uh, frequently mentioned together with Haskell, and there are several others. There's also, you know, there are several others. You can find them on, you know, if you keep clicking on Wikipedia, you find them. Yeah, that's that's basically okay. Okay, yeah, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, Eighty minutes. Yeah, that's. I think I'm gonna stop. Let's read comments. So let's have some chats, random chats. So say hi. So come on and say hi, and let's see. So Daniel was saying, okay, let me magnify the window and. Uh, so Daniel was talking about the geometry on a sphere. Okay, no, they're acting spherical geometry. Okay, I think Daniel is disagreeing with my characterization of spherical geometry. Okay. Okay, yeah, <laughs> maybe you are right, you know. Uh, So Daniel says, on, on a different subject, Daniel says, Cantor's incredible proof. I once saw a ref, uh, refutation of Cantor's diagonal argument on a blog post, some, <laughs> some crackpot. Yeah, there are a lot. You know, math, math, you know, in the field of math is quite different from programming. You know, in programming, anyone can say anything, you know, it's, that's why you have programming flame wars, you know, programming language flame wars, you know, like oh, OOP is the best or, or functional programming or, or some new, you know, paradigms like agile, you know, agile, fuck. So, but, but in math, you don't have things like that. Math, everything is like almost, everything is, you know, well defined and, uh, but however, there are also crack parts in math. But they are not like programmers, you know. They they are kind of different um, crackpots. Yeah, they, there's uh, quite a few. Uh, you see, okay. So so let me clarify. So what's the difference of a crackpot in programming community and in math? Okay, here here's the difference. If you are a crackpot, you know, you you cook up some idiotic pseudo scientific pseudoscience idea and in in the programming community you can become a hero like for example I you know I, I would I, I would say a few people I'd rather you know probably it's better not to mention them okay you you, you will become a hero like a, a leader of some big giant corporation and uh, with you know millions of programmer followers you know they think for, let, let me just say for example OOP oh, OOP is the greatest thing you know OOP will solve everything this happened in programming community and Perl you know Perl and laziness you know Perl you know is supposed to you know this or that more than one way to do it you know that those are crack parts and uh, for several years they've been rampant in the programming industry like every programmer believe it that's some of the example then <clears throat> there's lots of tons of examples like no sql oh no sql is the best thing because sql has these problems then today it seems <laughs> the the days of no sql is gone you know and uh, you know so so it's very common this happens in programming community so what i'm my my point is if you are you, you know you can be a crackpot but in programming community you can be you can become a leader like a hero like you know for idol you know for tens of years but i mean for 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 like 10 years or five or so <coughs> but not so with math now in math there are also crackpots but typically these you know these people they don't um they don't get big okay <laughs> they will not become an idol by by a, you know a lot of mathematicians not really they don't get big and every mathematician who actually studied you know uh, the math you know no no knows can tell they the, so the crackpots in math they only fool the mathematicians, you know, the like outsiders, 
yeah, there are such people. Like there are people saying that um, there are such people. You know, they 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 have a great number of followers, non mathematicians. He himself, you know, he he say, you know, I'm the greatest mathematician. You know, <laughs> one plus one equals two five because you know, and I have a lot of followers, but they are not mathematicians. They you know, so that's a difference. A crackpot in programming, you can be, become an idol, a hero, and with with you know funds, you know the funds will you know come to you. But for the mathematician crackpot, that usually that does not happen. Okay, usually that's not the case. Your followers, you know, if any, it's uh, the mathematicians. <coughs> uh, okay, so I have a lot of comments. Hey, hey, Louis. Uh, Okay, so let me, yeah, let, so uh, I've been talking for 90 minutes. Let me finish read the comments quick. Uh, so, Danielle, you got a lot of things to say. Like, I got, okay, so, um, so I'm gonna, you know, I gotta skip some comments. Uh, so, I, because I, I gotta go. I'm gonna get off. Uh, <laughs> Daniel says Brewer's intuition intuitionism is a bit nuts. Brewer quite clearly thinks that classical mathematics is a force. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so Sid, hey, good morning, Sid. So Sid says one problem I have seen in many programmers is that they believe certain difficult topics in math are actually quite easy. Oh, for example, uh, you know, like programmers and mathematicians, they are typically separate communities, you know, they, you know, they are not, yeah, of course, you know, there are a lot of programmers, there are a lot of mathematicians who are programmers and vice versa, but in general, they are just like two separate communities. It's like, Gamers, okay, gamers and programmers. You know, gamers is its own community. You know, you you have a bunch of gamers playing, you know, Overwatch. You know, playing Fortnite. What whatever is today, Minecraft. They have slants. You know, law me. They do means. They, they you know they they love that gamers. And programmers, that's a different community. But however, there are quite a lot. You know, programmers who are also gamers. You know, but in general, they are they are. You know they are different. Their mindset, they are you know they, they are just different. Same thing with the uh, mathematicians and programmers. You know, program usually the programmers they idol. They, you know, they idolize mathematician usually, like they they all, all math. But but in in general, programmers they don't know nothing. Like like they don't have the basic undergrad. They, like for example, <laughs> you know, sorry for saying this. Uh, Justin, okay, all, all those Haskell programmers, you know, the Haskell programmers, they talk about, oh, type theory, oh, theory, oh, category theory, theory, you know, improve, oh, ISO, you know, Curry, uh, Howard, isomorphism, you know. But then you look at them, you ask them what's a group theory, they, they don't know what is a group, they don't, <laughs> they don't know what is a group, like the fundamental building block of math, they, they don't know, most of them are like that. You know, the, some of the, you know, today younger generation, they talk about Haskell all day, or theory, because, oh, you know, referential transparency, because this, or therefore, you know, the, the, this, that, 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 math, then they don't know what is a group. <laughs> what the fuck? That's why I don't like, you know, well, well you know, because, <laughs> you know, I, that's why I don't like the, I, I usually, you know, attack those, uh, you know, I don't like pop, you know, whatever is popular. <coughs> hey, Jaden, uh, Jaden Seras. Uh, so let me see. Uh, homotopy type theory. Yeah, I want to, oh my God, today, I, actually, I wanted to show you some links and some, um, <sighs> And uh, it turns out, you know, I didn't cover them. I, you know, I, by the way, John, uh, this guy, John Bayes, he's a great mathematician, okay? He taught me many math over the past five years. You know, he, he's a math blogger, okay? He, 
Well, professionally, he is now a um, quantum physicist. Okay, he, he he that's his research area right now. You know, currently, but 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 he 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 is also a math blogger. You know, he talk about math. Uh, like uh, educational, um, not just you know there are a lot of educational math out there. Like typically they are like community building, you know, funny funny um, mobile strip. They show you how to you know create a mobile strip. You know those are those are fun, but th they they have no depth. This guy John Carlos Base, he he when we when he talk about math, he talk about depth. You know. Uh, well, typically you have to have a undergraduate, you know, just undergraduate math degree, to to get it. You know, well, that that is actually true. But anyway, so so you know, so I enjoy he, a lot of his. Um, you know, you can learn from it. Uh, but even if you don't have a math degree, you can follow him because you have to start somewhere. You know, just just read, just read and whatever. Then if it's you know, uh, you know, if it's far ahead of you, then you, then don't you know ignore it. You know, it's, you have to start somewhere. So anyway, he is a so he's a quantum physicist. You know, he and he has there are several his vi uh, videos on YouTube you can find. Just search his name, John Bayes. Okay, and he's also a big fan of category theory. You know, he's a category theorist, and he has uh, websites. But anyway, so. I highly recommend it. You know, uh, you follow him. He's on Twitter. Um, yes, but uh, th so there's this homotopy type theory. Okay, so yeah, that's another to topic. I'm trying to learn this. Uh, this is something I'm really interested. Uh, this is a, a a kind of a new foundation. You know, one of the approach, one of the school of thought for the foundation of math. And this foundation, this school of thought, is amenable to programming. You know, so if you are Haskell coder, you would be interested in this highly, uh, because this way of treating math can be codified into programming languages. You know, th uh, uh, and uh, so so this this book is free on the web, but it's hard to read. I tried to read it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's hard to read. Uh, so you have table of contents, you know, type theory versus fifth th th theory. You know, it's hard to read, uh, and uh, it's invented by this guy Vladimir Vladimir Vovosky, uh, a uh, Russian. Uh, he died like two years ago, uh, and uh, you know, here is one of his article. It's you know, it's great to read. Great to read. How I became interested in foundations of math. So he tells you his journey, and he's by the way he's a he also won uh, uh, awards in math. So, by the way, th I, I, there's something I want to say to any of you programmers. You know, if you really want to learn math, you know, you cannot just um, okay. Let me say, you know, let me say to Haskell fans, you know, kind of like you know the pop Haskell fans. If you really want to get into math, you cannot. Just say, oh, I'm just going to stick to category theory. You know, it's not like just like that. You have to learn. You know, for, uh, you have to learn. You know, the basics of logic, the uh, the basics of you know group theory is uh, almost fundamental. <coughs> for example, you know this guy who created the foundation. You know this homotopy type theory. Uh, this is new, by the way. So this is actually. Cutting edge, you know, in in the math proofs community, this is kind of cutting edge. Only began in the last ten years, and it's created by him. And he, you know, so like John Bayes told me, actually, you know, you see, so he wrote this article, how I became interested in foundation of math. You read it, you see the history; it's fantastic. Okay, he, you know, it's not, and and also, and by the way, this article also. Um, was shown to me by base on on um, shit. Am I frozen? Uh, 
okay so looks like okay so this article am I still talking okay so this article was shown to me by base and John base also said you know he told me here that you know Vadima Vodosky was better at math than most of us okay he's being polite he's one of the great mathematician okay base uh, you know, he says, okay, Vadimo is was better than math than most of us. And he has spent years mastering homotopy theory before inventing homotopy type theory. Okay, so this is critical. So it's not like, you know, he just invented homotopy type theory. He's, he studied years in homotopy theory, which is very interesting. Homotopy theory is a, you know, that's, it, it, it's part of the topology very abstract and and uh, difficult you know so anyway so what i'm my point is that you know if you are a programmer you you know don't don't try to you know don't think you're gonna cut corners you know i'm just going to study graph theory and i'll know math it's not like that okay <laughs> f you so what uh So Sid says Krepper. So we back in the mine. Krepper, oh man, what, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> okay, we got a troll, I guess. This Louis Sarah's guy. I don't know what he's. Uh, Oh, that's a book by John Bayes. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think that's it for today. So thank you guys for coming. Yeah, that's it for today. One hour, hundred minutes. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you guys. Bye.